to have rain on the way, I had to make some minor adjustments with oh, some outdoor carpeting and moving things around so that way I can move everything out of the way if it does start to rain. And <laughs> it's hilarious. One of these days I'll just leave the umbrella up and see if it'll hold off the rain. <laughs> I think I'd rather spray that with something and see if the water repellent would hold up underneath the 100 degree weather. But God allows all circumstances to come into our life for a purpose. So we can either fight against that or recognize it for what it is, which is God in control, and adapt to it. Meaning that there's a benefit to rain. There's a blessing that comes with not trying to fight through what you want to do, but recognizing sometimes we need to stop, take a look at maybe where we're coming from and where we're going, and reevaluate what we've been doing along the way. I know for myself that without taking second or third thoughts of what I may have prayed about or thought about or read in my Bible or even shared in devotions or emotions, then I could easily confuse what maybe God had spoken or said. But if I re-examine myself according to Scripture, then I'm confirmed or confused. <laughs> Which, that's why we have devotions and we share them morning, noon, and night, and we go through our day and we always stay in constant contact in constant relationship with Jesus because it's easy to get turned to the left or the right but it's so much simpler if we just listen to what he has to say and when he directs us that ah, you're going off track to bring us back to the straight and narrow when you face trials have you ever looked at another Christian and thought they've got it made they are so blessed of God because they have what you want maybe the person has a great marriage Maybe she or she has a husband or he has a wife who loves Jesus. Maybe she has children who love the Lord and desire with all their hearts to serve him. Maybe he has a wonderful job. Or maybe he has the kind of relationship with his children that you long to have, but don't. Maybe he has a successful vocation or a rewarding ministry. Maybe she has material blessings that have not kept her from loving Jesus. Maybe, well, maybe. Whatever seems ideal to you, whatever you want so badly but don't have, that's what we're talking about. Sometimes we look at the goodness of God in someone else's life and wish we could experience the same. What brings me to my next question is, how often have you heard someone say, the Lord has been so good to us, as they have shared something good that just happened to them? I've heard it often, as a matter of fact, from my own lips, and yet, when I say or hear an expression like this, the thought often crosses my mind, would they, would I have said this if something bad happened instead? Would we say, you know, praise the Lord, you know, I just got, I just lost my job. I just got fired. <laughs> Probably not. You know, I have to stop that right there for a minute, because we in the Jesus movement, we actually did that kind of stuff. We, uh... It was goofy, it was crazy, but it was true. That's what we did. You know, we're living proof that it can be done. Was that we'd go, wow, praise the Lord. You mean you lost your job? What's God going to do? Isn't that neat? It's exciting to see what he's going to do for you and how he's going to reveal his will. And man, isn't that great? Just, I can't believe it, you know, that God would actually use you in such a way to be fired, you know, and to, to take you into a new place with him. You know, and, you know that just blesses my thoughts off. <laughs> we used to talk like that. And... To this day, I still think that it's a better way to live than it is in the way that a lot of times that people take so personal some of the things that happen in their life and don't turn it back to God and re recognize His hand in them. But that was just a personal insight. Perhaps your experience with God is quite different than it probably is. We seem to associate blessings only with the goodness of God. However, to do so is to be ignorant of the purpose of the trials, the difficulties, the hardships and testings that suddenly invade our lives, that do not seem to invade the lives of those we envy. 
We see trials as robbers, bent on stealing our joy or our sense of God's blessing and goodness. We treat trials as though they were attacks from the enemy, as though Satan were after us. We forget sometimes trials are sent by God. How earthbound we are, how temporal our perspective. To the child of God, even trials are cause for rejoicing. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. James 1, 2, 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into diverse trials and tribulations, knowing that the working of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you might be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. <laughs> Even so, James is a fun book. When you encounter a trial, God says you are to consider it all joy. Why? Because no matter what the trial is, it has a purpose. And that purpose is to make you perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. The word for perfect is teleos, or teleois, which means complete or mature, in essence, Christ-like, or like Jesus. And because trials are permitted by God, filtered into our lives through his fingers of love for the purpose of making us like Jesus, we can know that no child of God is exempt from trials. You will go through them. Those who seem so blessed of God, those whom you might have a tendency to envy, are also going to endure trials if they are genuinely His. However, their trials will not necessarily be the same as yours. In fact, they may be going through trials right now, but you don't see it or recognize it. Do you know why? Because, beloved, you are not the same as any other person. You are uniquely you. So God has a unique individual set of circumstances just for you, <laughs> which he will use to refine you and purify you. You ever wanted to hear about you? Guess what? It's all about you. <laughs> so that you will come through the fire of affliction with the dross of your ungodliness consumed. After Jesus told Peter how he was going to suffer and die, he said to him, follow me. John 21:19. Peter, seeing his fellow disciple John, asked John, asked Jesus what was going to happen to him. Jesus replied, What's that to you? You follow me. John 21, 22. According to tradition, Peter was crucified, martyred during the reign of Nero. John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos and later returned to Ephesus, where he was reported to have died a natural death in old age. Yet John was no more blessed by our Lord than Peter. Both men were blessed, and the trials of their faith, unique as they were, were used to make each more like Jesus. When trials come your way, as inevitably they will, do not, do not run away. Don't hide. And don't be envious of others who seem more blessed of God, because they are not enduring what you're experiencing. And don't make the mistake in the midst of your trial of not recognizing the goodness of God in allowing the trial. It is producing in you perfection. Consider it all joy. Count it a blessing. To consider it all joy is to look past the temporal or temporary down the long road into the eternal or eternity. To look beyond the trial to the end result, which is you. Perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Remember, only two things will matter when you see your Lord. How Christ-like you have become, and the quality of your work for Him. Trials are blessings in disguise to get you to that point of Christ-like and the works that you do. If we believe this and act accordingly, we will say with Peter, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When Jesus appears, or when you stand before him, will you feel shame, or will you feel love?
will you feel pushed away or will you feel running to him? Every day that we have devotions and evotions, we can run to him and practice what we say we preach. We can experience God as real and living today, if we choose to. But in your trials, if you're only looking at them as being something that pushes you away from God, then you're missing the point. A trial is meant to test you, but also to turn you in one direction, to Jesus. When you have a trial, when you have a testing, it's not like a tested in our lives that we say, oh, let's see how much you've learned. Now answer these questions, one through a hundred, and if you score 100, you're perfect. But, you know, make sure you answer every one and fill in the blanks. And we'll score it afterwards. That's not the kind of test that God puts in your life. The test is where will you turn when it happens to you? Will you turn to your own understanding, or will you turn to God? When you have a test, the simplest way to pass a test isn't to try to figure it out yourself and do it yourself. It's to ask Jesus to help you. It's that simple. Turn it around, turn it to Him, and you'll turn it upside down, and it'll wind up being, for you, a win. Because in the end, you win. So guess what? You can either learn to depend upon Him now, or you'll find out later, you should have depended upon him then. Because it's so much easier to walk with Jesus than you think, day by day, with just whatever's happening today. So turn it over to the Father. Turn it over to the Son. Turn it over to Jesus. And guess what? <laughs> Somebody's going to be out there looking at you and saying, you won. But I think... God got you.